So good afternoon, everybody, and a very warm welcome to this in second uh, session Inverness Paul's Cyber Essential Series of three webinars. So we had one two weeks ago. I think some of you were probably on that session and we were hearing about inside and outside threats. Um, next Tuesday, 31st January, is our third session, and that's going to be about prevention and uh, resilience building. Um, so hopefully we'll welcome you along to that too. Um, but today's session is about risk mitigation, and I'm delighted to welcome two speakers for this session. Uh, the first is Peter Arseg from Lockton Insurance, where he's senior VP, and very importantly, a former CISO who uh, previously has worked at Visa Europe and EE. So he's going to give us some really great insights, not, in, not just into the insurance market, but into the market and into risk mitigation from the standpoint of somebody who's been there and seen it and done it. Our second speaker today is one of my colleagues who's legal director at Bernays Paul, Nick Wardlow. And Nick is going to run us through some of the, the ways in which we can take preparatory steps as an organisation to better mitigate some of the risks that we see in cyber. Um, the session is being recorded um, and I hope everybody, I think everybody is on mute. Um, we will have a live chat function. It's down at the bottom of your screens. And so we'd absolutely encourage you to drop in any comments, any um, queries or any questions you'd like me to pose to the speaker later on. Um, the session is structured in three sections. So we'll hear from Peter first, then we'll move on to Nick, and then we're going to do a Q&A. And that's where I'd absolutely invite you to either press the button and, and give the comment or pop a comment in the chat function, and I will pick it up. Um, just standing back for a moment, so risk mitigation and in particular insurance, which I know came up in our first session, people were interested in that. The insurance market in cyber is a real hot topic at the moment. And there's lots of headline news articles that are, I think, confusing, certainly to the organizations I deal with around the extent of cyber policy, the risks that they cover, what they don't cover, will they pay out? And for a market that's worth more than 10 billion globally, at least in, in 2021, and it's supposed to double, it maybe hasn't seen quite the same emphasis being placed on it in the UK. And that's a point perhaps Peter can pick up on. But interestingly, with the cost of, uh, cost of, of, of living crisis and the pressure on businesses in the UK, in 2021, 30% of SMEs cancelled their cyber policies. Concerns around premium increases, um, concerns around whether or not it was value for money, concerns around whether in fact they could meet some of the requirements that insurance companies were placing on them were all considerations I think that factored into some of that decision making. So Peter, turning to you first of all, um, I'd really like to get your observations on what is going on in the UK cyber insurance market at the moment and, and give us a bit of your insight into some of the chatter around cyber products being removed or, or being scaled back due to the kind of concern over rising costs. So over to you, Peter. Thanks, Hazel. Um, so I'll try and paint a little bit of a picture about when I joined uh, insurance with Lockton about seven years ago and, and coming straight out of the EE as a CISO, one of the first things I kind of um, discovered straight away was uh, there was a, a lack of understanding um, within the uh, insurance market um, about the risks they were writing, certainly in my, from, from my professional opinion. So, you know, there was um, the products there, um, you know, depending on the size of business, especially for SME, maybe we ask 10 questions, um, find out what your revenue is, and then um, we'll give you a premium. And if you think about it as a CISO, you know, it's probably 300, 400 sort of things that go through your mind um, around um, how to manage your risk. So you can see there's a big difference between perhaps the understanding a risk insurance market had and, and actually um, the, the actual risk was there. But all was fine in the world. There was definitely claims being paid, um, but cost of capital was cheap. The claims weren't massively expensive. So all the insurance market was making money and it was seen as the new hot thing in insurance. Um, about two years ago, that changed significantly. And, and really what drove that change was a change in behavior by the attackers around ransomware. Ransomware had been around a long time, um, something, you know, 20 years ago we were worried about, but it was more just a nuisance thing at a lot of that time, unless you're really unlucky, 
It was one workstation, a couple of workstations, maybe a server. Maybe if you're unlucky, there was a bit of data on that server. But you were talking thousands, tens of thousands of pounds to, 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 to remediate. Pretty much overnight, the attack has changed to um, spending a lot more time around the ransomware. Instead of going from a shotgun approach, which is just firing stuff out to see what they hit, if they got a target, they got into your business, spent a bit of time in your business to try and work out what you do, um, when's a really an appropriate time to attack you, um, and, and how much you're likely to pay. Um, and then they drop the ransomware. So classic examples might be like, like TravelX um, in the UK when they dropped it on New Year's Eve. Um, and, and that was, they'd been in the network for a period of time. So all overnight, you didn't really see a change in frequency of, um, of claims, but you did see a change in the quantum, so the cost. So those books that have been running along quite happily making a profit, pretty much overnight went on fire. And by that, I mean, you're starting to look at 100%, 100% plus losses. So all of a sudden, there's a business that's no longer attainable. So you saw then a couple of things. You saw a, quite a significant change in right overnight, the questions that people ask to get almost like a gatekeeping to you had to meet this. You saw a huge increase in premium because ultimately they're trying to recover their losses uh, from before and then still make a profit. And then you also saw, especially out of Lloyd's, and this is where you start sort of seeing some about does insurance pay out or not, other products that had cyber coverage in it, maybe property, or at least wasn't clear that it had cyber or not, and we call that silent cyber, um, either starting to get claims on, so something like um, Not Picture or um, WannaCry was an example where people try to claim as a business erupt on their property insurance, which was never really intended for. So you started seeing court cases on that and, and news about cyber not paying out, but it really wasn't cyber insurance, it was property. Um, so you saw Lloyd's clamping down on that, saying you have to now be clear in your policies whether you cover cyber or not. Um, and then the, the thing that's come out sort of recently, I guess, is, is, is the talk about the systemic risk. And, and by that, we mean if you're insuring throughout the world, lots of different companies, you could think you've got, um, uh, uh, you're spreading your risk by maybe manufacturing, retail, finance, et cetera. But if all of those clients use Amazon Web Services or um, Google or even a little widget that's in the software, that all those clients use and that gets compromised, then from an insurance market point of view, it could collapse and that's the systemic risk. And that's some of the talk around we've, we've heard at the moment about how do you manage that? And I guess the last point on that would be the, the, um, the nation state side. So obviously with the, the Russian Ukrainian side and talk about active war and, and that side of it. So where, we're, where the market is at the moment, it's kind of coming out of the hard market side and we call that a hard market when it, it all goes belly up, um, then effectively we're starting to see um, more people coming into the market. So I think that that goes to show that actually it's just, it is sustainable if you do it right. Um, the premiums, while they're not coming down, are stabilizing and the question set becoming um, more standardized. So I think the market is, um, it is definitely gone through turmoil um, and it's learned a hard lesson but hopefully we're starting to see some sort of um, growth, the shoots of growth coming out the other side of it. That's really interesting. And I've never heard of the phrase silent cyber before. Um, just thinking about the, the, the people dialing in today and, and there's no such thing as an average organization and, and there's lots of people representing different business sectors and different business sizes. But from your experience and in the role that you've got now and the roles that you've had before, what, what, what are the top few things an organisation should think of if they are considering getting cyber insurance? So that's for those organisations that maybe don't have something in place, although very welcome to hear your, your, your thoughts on those that maybe do have cyber insurance in place and what they should look at and go back and review. But if they are looking to put something in place? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and I think, I guess there's two answers to that. One is cyber insurance is part of your risk transfer, but it shouldn't be your risk transfer. So ultimately, uh, it, it, insurance is the financial transfer of risk onto another mechanism. You either keep it on your balance sheet, you um, maybe invest it back in your business, you go to the market like insurance. Um, so really that's 
um, part of the risk discussion, or it should be, but it should kind of be the end piece, if you like. The first bit is around actually you run a risk as a business, no matter what business you have. If you have any sort of technology that connects to the internet or anybody does anything data, you have that business. So understanding that risk is important. Um, there are some, um, no matter whether you buy insurance or not, there's some really key things that you should be looking at doing. So, you know, simple things um, or <laughs> basics, I call them, not easy to do necessarily, but they are the basics and they haven't really changed for 20, 30 years. So it's about, you know, how you manage access to your system. We still use, use their own password, which has been terrible security for 20, 25 years, but it's still relevant. But things like multiple factor authentication, where you have a, a, a second mechanism. So whether that's an SMS on your phone or an app or a token, when you log in, especially externally, um, that gives a level of uh, a second level of authentication. And why that's important? Well, if I'm an attacker, I really want to try and get access to your systems. And that might be by by an email or a phishing email where you click something, or it might be, hey, it's Costa Coffee. Here's your free new coffee coming out of Manchester. Please put your your company use it in password, and we'll give you the voucher. Oh, great! I'll get my coffee. And so I've got that. You know, I get that um, user ID password, and enables me to get a foothold into your network because that's really what I'm after. So using things like MFA, and you'll see that from an insurance point of view as well. Um, Whereas it becomes one of their, I guess, gatekeeping things. If you don't have it, you just don't get through. Um, training and awareness, your staff are still the most important first line of defense. Um, you can't rely on that, unfortunately. Um, and if you come up with a solution for me able to, to get people to know that, to, to psychologically have the difference between, you know, I'm sitting on the London tube, here's my debit card, so my top pocket and my PIN number is 1746. Everybody laughed, they wouldn't do that. But from a corporate point of view, we've never been able to instill that into our staff, that it's the same process. So, you know, there's definitely that challenge there. Um, I think this, um, the other one I'd probably throw out there uh, is, um, is scenario testing. So if you have an issue today, who do you call? Who in your business starts making the decision? Is that clear? Um, if I have an issue, do I know who to call? And the reason why we say that is that um, these, these issues always happen at like a 2 a.m. on a Saturday morning or when you're on a plane somewhere and it, it doesn't happen at 10 a.m., on a Tuesday when everybody's ready to do it. So the more that you can get ahead of the curve, know, know the big decisions that your company might make. Do you call the police or not? You know, It sounds simple, but actually there's business ramifications for doing that. So the more you can kind of war game that up front, um, I think it's really worth the, the hour sitting around with the, the senior leaders in the organization, just having that discussion. Um, so that's sort of some simple things that come out. There's obviously a lot more in there, um, but, but given that the majority of risk at the moment to business in the UK is around ransomware, it's around, can you stop people getting access to your system? If they do, can you stop them getting access to your backups or can you recover from a backup? Um, and then the third one is, you know, how does your business operate in that sort of scenario? A classic example at the moment, if you need it, it would be Royal Mail or the international side of it. They're going through this right now. And thinking about, before I move on, I'm thinking about the kind of, concept of the insurance policy C can you just throw out I know time's not on our side but throw out a couple of the what you would consider the obvious benefits of cyber insurance that people might not be aware of but also maybe a couple of limitations that, that you've seen organizations maybe not understand so yeah. both sides um okay well I guess the first thing is applying for cyber insurance gives you a free assessment it's pretty coarse but the application that you fill out, if the insurance market comes back and says, we're not going to insure you, you've immediately got an example saying you're probably not in a great space from an insurance point of view. It's quite coarse, um, but, it, but it definitely gives you that. Um, the second part is that the, the insurance policies come with um, a support team. So 24 by 7, 365, you can call a number, get a hold of it. It's normally run by a law firm, so you get privileged um, under that, but then they can help you as a bridge coach understand the decisions you need to make as a business and bring in the support team, whether it's forensics, legal, marketing, et cetera. So that obviously helps you. Um, and then the third part, which is the financial transfer risk, which is where you come in, you need to sort of need to be a little, understand what you're trying to do. So if you understand the quantum cost to your business, so how much it could cost you if you have, an, have a cyber incident, then you can look at how best to, to, to mitigate that, whether it's insurance, et cetera. And that's why it's important at the moment with the hard market to sort of understand that and why you sort of see some companies reducing limits 
because they understand actually under a certain amount, I'm more likely to have an incident cost me that than over a certain amount. So that's important. Um, the limitation side of it, um, it's actually pretty broad coverage, but I think where people get confused often is around social engineering and crime. Um, so if somebody um, emails you to say, hi, I'm the, the you know, I'm the CEO, <laughs> we're, we're purchasing, um, you know, a business out of Africa, can you please send some money to this account in, in Hong Kong, and you do send that, even though they used an email, that's a crime issue, not a cyber issue. Cyber is only when somebody's met a security incident within the business. So, so I think that's one that you, you often see as a gotcha. Um, so it's understanding where the different policies work, um, remove the confusion. But broadly, um, the cyber policies do what they say on their tin. Um, uh, and it's, it's just those but understanding the nuances where they don't work is important. Yeah. And a question that came up last time um, from one of the, the attendees, which I, I'd like to pose to you because we had a bit of a chat about it, was if you're known to have cyber insurance, does that actually make your organisation a target for further yeah. services? What it's a good question. And, and, and I guess logically you think it would, but I say it doesn't. And, that is, and the only reason that would potentially would be is that maybe if one of the big insurers had a breach and your data was compromised and then somebody knew about it, it could. But ultimately, normally when an attacker is attacking an, uh, first thing in the environment, they probably don't know who you are. So I'm not necessarily going after the big name, I'm just finding a vulnerability. It's a bit like the old telephone dialing and whoever answers the call, it's the same on the internet. Now, during that, during that investigation, trying to work out your business and find your backups, if I happen to find something that said, hey, you've got a policy for 10 million, well, that's potentially gonna help me in my ransomware side because it gives me information on it. But I don't think it makes you more of a target or anything. It just um, ultimately at that stage, you're already a target because they're in your network and it's just more information around. If you think about these attackers, think of it as a business, it's more market intelligence that they have on what you might pay from a ransom. Um, you, you've talked you've talked a lot about um, ransomware being the big threat. Uh, qu quick question, if there's ever a quick question and a quick answer. What are your views on organisations paying the ransom? Uh, it's a really interesting one. Um, and you asked that the hardest one, probably. For Sorry. A quick answer <laughs> um, I think, you know, ethically, a lot of businesses in the UK say they'll never pay it. Um, but what's really interesting is when your business is about to go under because you cannot operate and you've only got a period of time before you become bankrupt or insolvent, that can change the, the pressure. So I think really it's like um, it's good to have a, a stance. It's important to know who you're paying if you do pay, because if it happens to be Russia or it happens to be a sanctioned territory, you've got a whole other other issues you might be doing. And there's also the issue around funding, um, funding crime. But ultimately, I think um, it, it does change under pressure. So I'm quite open to the to the thought around it because ultimately, you know, certainly when I'm talking to my clients, it's about how you manage your business and how you manage risk. But I think it's really important before you make any decision that you have that legal input and you have that forensic input about if you pay, are they going to give you your key back to decrypt your data? Because there's, there's some that just won't. Um, and, and there's actually quite a lot of um, intelligence about understanding who your attacker is before you make that decision but it's not it's, it's a real easy one to do on a scenario testing i'm not going to pay but actually in reality when you're under pressure then that's i think why we see organizations ending up having to pay and and really the best point is if you make sure that your backups for example are, are secure that they can't be compromised so they're not on the same network, they're in a different environment, even old school, put them on tape and put them in a physical safe, and you can recover from that, then that makes the decision much easier because you're not in a point where you can never recover. No, I think that's a really good point. And I know that there are some incidents at the moment where you know backups have been compromised and, and that does create a slightly different tension and narrative. Yeah. Um, as a as a former CISO, would would you take cyber insurance? Yeah, really good question. Because before I started, no. Before I started working in insurance, no. I mean, I, I looked at it in 2011 and looked at it and, and, the, and the wording was pretty immature and it didn't really seem to cover what we wanted and I said, look, actually, no. And I think a lot of my colleagues in the, in the security space still have that mindset that, that cyber insurance doesn't cover um, the issues that I have. Now I've worked in insurance 
And putting back to my point that it's a financial transfer of risk, yes. But yes, I'd have a discussion of making sure I understand the quantum, the quantum cost of the business. So how much an incident would cost and then have that discussion about how's best, how is it best then to transfer that risk and how do we want to do it as a business. But I think you know, the problem we have at the moment is the market is quite difficult and the premiums are quite high. When that stabilizes a, a bit and comes down again, then it is a valid way of transferring the financial risk that organization has into the market. Great, thank you, Peter. And I, I see that there's a, a great question in the chat function, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave you, Peter, to have a little look at that and we'll pick that up in the Q&A session. Um, thanks, Peter, that's terrific. Nick, if I can uh, hand over the baton to you. So Nick is a, one of our legal directors in our investigations team and he supports um, lots of organisations across the UK in handling cyber incidents and in dealing with all of the factors that it, that it it brings including regulators and third parties so nick can you talk us through some of the preparatory steps that organizations can take to try and manage and mitigate their risks better over to you thanks hazel um good afternoon everyone um so i'm just going to cover in the next uh 15 minutes or so some really practical but uh, very high level points on as hazel said steps that all companies regardless of their size or sector should be taking if they haven't already done so or to the extent they have, then should be revisiting on a regular basis to ensure that they're up to date uh, and effective. Um, so these steps constitute risk mitigation. So they're not necessarily going to avoid any cybersecurity incident, but so long as the business has planned well for an incident, they should reduce the impact both financially and reputationally. Now, a key point, as hopefully will come clear on, on all these steps, is they're not generic ticks tick box steps. So for them to be effective, the company has to engage fully with them and tailor them um, to the specific business that they run. And crucially, this needs to involve employees from all across the business. So all the different parts of the organization who would be dealing firsthand with any um, cyber incident. So clearly the IT team, but also the management board, HR, comms, risk, uh, and any other parts of the business. So I'm, I'm going to treat the uh, the steps in five different buckets. So the first bucket being uh, an initial risk assessment. So to understand how best to both protect the company and respond to a cybersecurity incident, the business first needs to understand where its particular vulnerabilities lie. Now, the key to this is to get an external uh, IT forensic consultant on board at a really early stage um, to, to carry out this risk assessment. Now, as Peter said, sometimes hackers uh, are not targeting specific companies, but, but often that they will target a, a company for a particular reason. So that could be a particular high profile, the fact that they have the means to pay a ransom demand, or they may face an immediate pressure to resume business as usual, which would make it more likely for them to pay up. Now, there are certain characteristics that might make a business a more likely target, including them being a household name, um, a particular political significance, if they're part of critical infrastructure or national security or they're a regulated business, or as, as Peter said, it may be that they're just unlucky um, and there wasn't a particular reason for it. But an IT consultant will be able to come in, carry out a review and a sort of mapping exercise across the company's security systems, review the procedures in place and advise on any specific changes that can be implemented. Now, I'm not going to run through what those changes are, and, th and there are a number of them. And, and as Peter said, they feed into the uh, wider question of, of what an insurance uh, company would look at as well in terms of what the business has in place. But they would include, as Peter said, multi-factor authentication, um, implementing more regular password changes, longer passwords, data backups, endpoint protection, network testing, and there's a whole range of different steps of business should be considering putting into place and an, and an IT consultant can advise them on that. And then separate to that is whoa, one of the key vulnerabilities faced by a business is the supply chain. Um, so whereas a company can focus its uh, activities on its own infrastructure, if the, if the supply chain creates its own vulnerabilities, then the company will be exposed on that level as well. So again, any external mapping that could be done should input, should bring in within the scope of that exercise 
um, the business's integration with its supply chain and how to address any risks associated with that. So that's the first bucket. Um, moving on to the second is carrying out a review of contracts, documents in place with third parties. Um, so once a business has sort of assessed its own, um, you know, as part of its assessment of its own weaknesses, it should carry out a review of its contracts with third parties, ideally as early as possible before any potential incident. So that means it will have an opportunity to assess any vulnerabilities, identify any obligations it has so that it has an opportunity to change them or adapt them uh, before a, a critical issue occurs. Now this will involve assessing each party's respective obligations. So to what extent they have data security obligations or notification obligations in respect to an incident, what rights it has, so security testing rights, audit rights, and significantly what happens in the event of an incident. So what is the company's liability and what exclusions are in place in respect to that liability. It's very important for the business to understand what its position is vis-a-vis -vis third parties. Now, as part of that review, that will necessarily Im involve a degree of engagement with the third parties. And that in itself might be a helpful um, exercise. It's very common for businesses never to have had sort of detailed discussions with its third party suppliers or vendors around this issue. So it could be a means of instigating a, a constructive dialogue because it, it is a distinct possibility that the business and its third parties will be forced to work together in response to a cyber incident. So much better to establish that relationship and that dialogue um, at an early stage. Moving on to the third bucket. So this is the sort of broad category of uh, implementing or having in place instant management response plans. And again, this, this will feed into the analysis that any insurance company will carry out. Now, most businesses these days, to their credit, will have some form of instant management response plan in place. But the key question is, is that plan up to date? Is it effective? And is it accessible to those who need it? One of the sort of key points that's come out of this seminar series and, and our discussions with clients is, is how to treat those response plans. They should They should be seen to be an active organic being so anyone can go online these days and there are, are tons of different template response plans available they're often incredibly long technically detailed uh, and hard to navigate but for them to be effective the business needs to engage with them actively so a business was not going to be served well by having a long uh, document filed away in a cupboard sitting under a layer of dust that that no one's read or no one quite knows where it is an effective plan needs to be tailored to the specific business. It needs to have been inputted into by the, the people who will actively be assisting with an instant response uh, firsthand. And it needs to be available. So it needs to be in soft and hard copy. Uh, and it's got to be tested. A, a totally theoretical response isn't going to be very effective if it hasn't been tested in practice. So that could be through uh, some sort of mock training um, scenario or role play and it should be regularly reviewed and updated so companies plans and systems and personnel change and so the plan should be updated to reflect that the key for any plan therefore is what what the company is looking for is to be able to roll out a quick effective and a practical response to an incident so there are a number of um, items that the plan should cover and again they can be very detailed I'm not going to cover them here now but there are sort of at a very high level there should be a, an instant severity matrix there should be a checklist of steps to take uh, in the event of an incident uh, a list of key contacts and their contact details around the clock uh, and an activity log so that the, in the event of an incident the company is logging every single step that they're taking um, from the from the day that instant onwards on a purely practical point of view, that one of the key steps is having in place a short summary document that sets out the contact details of, of anyone who might need to be contacted in the event of an incident. Now, 
they've it's quite possibly there's a scenario where everyone, where the business's networks go down so that document needs to be printed out in um, hard copy it needs to be available to anyone who will need to get their hands on it 24 7 as peter said these incidents quite often occur at two o'clock in the morning so make sure that anyone who needs to get their hands on it can do so at any time of day even if everyone's emails have gone down so on implementing these plans the, the key i suppose point for the business is that they need to be effective they need someone needs to be able to identify them they need to be able to refer to them and use them straight away in the event of any unexpected incident so there's never going to be a standard template which will suit every business but it is important that that the business works on it creates something that works for that specific business linked to that and moving on to the the fourth bucket now is the training program and, and uh, similar themes will, come out in terms of how to approach creating an effective training program um the training program uh, as we said the, the employees the workforce are, are the first line of defense and hugely important in 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 mitigating the risk of any incident so the workforce needs to understand what are those risks and how can they be mitigated what is good data practice how should the business be going about protecting its data how, what steps need to be taken in in the event of an incident and what are individuals specific roles in carrying out that instant response plan it's it's a case of um, any training program again needs to be tailored but not only to, just to the business itself but to the different parts of the business so it's not a case of one training program fits the entirety of the business different parts of the company will have different roles and responsibilities in implementing a, a response to an incident and that should be reflected by the training regime so again it should be treated as an active organic being it should be updated regularly it should be interactive um, and also it should be challenging if someone turns up to a training program or a training session they shouldn't know what to expect it shouldn't feel like a sort of rote performance so that can be instigated by the company uh, feeding in uncertainties asking questions of employees that they might not have had to consider as we were discussing earlier would the business uh, be prepared to respond or pay a ransom request how will the business communicate internally if all its systems are disconnected everyone needs to be engaging on these questions on a really practical basis of what would they do faced with that question at that point and the aim of that is to create an overall compliance culture where people are getting used to thinking through these ideas where lessons become muscle memory and it's a question of just building up resilience across uh, the organization and that requires a lot of engagement frequent engagement um, from everyone who might be involved but also training i think should be seen as an opportunity it's an it's an opportunity for the business to explain to its employees why they might be making changes or taking certain steps in the name of cyber security so it gives the company an opportunity to explain the motives and bring employees along on that journey which which can be very helpful um now that takes me to the, the last bucket which is the role of external advisors and I, th I think this is a point that in, in our experience with clients that we can't stress enough of the importance of having a, an established team of external advisors on hand straight away the last thing uh, any business wants to be doing in the event of a cyber incident is scrabbling around trying to find advisors engage them negotiate fees and terms sign contracts the, in an ideal situation any business will have a, a, a set of external advisors who have been engaged who understand the business and are ready to act straight away and creating that two-way relationship is beneficial to, to to both sets of parties so um for the advisors they will understand the business's needs and their systems and we've much better place to advise quickly and help out and for the business itself it can seek advice in advance on best practice from the advisors and then it will also have that availability round the clock availability 
ready to deploy if needed. Um, now, uh, different businesses will require a different sort of suite of advisors to be ready, but generally they're going to involve a, an IT consultant being the, the key uh, first responder in the event of an incident. So they, they need to have instant response and forensic capability around the clock. Uh, an insurer, to the extent that the company wants to have cyber insurance in place, that uh, insurance contract should be established and a relationship built up with the insurer. Um, there may be key service providers, depending on the business. There may be um, that the business needs to have an established relationship with key service providers who are ready to assist in the event of an incident. And again, there may be key stakeholders that will need to be involved right at the outset, who will need to be notified uh, and uh, be involved in any incident response um, plan. The company may want to have a PR, reputation management advisor, engaged and on hand to assist, to assist in mitigating damage to the reputation that might flow from any incident. And then finally, legal advisors. So, I mean, as lawyers and in our experience, when it comes to a cyber incident, we're often overlooked right at the outset and sometimes we're not brought on board until later on in the process, which I think we would say is an error. There are certain steps that we can advise and assist companies on upfront before any incident has occurred. So risk mitigation strategy. So talking through some of the, the buckets that are, I've just um, covered. So advising on instant response plans, training programs, um, and general strategy in terms of engaging advisors and reviewing contracts with third parties. So that's on the, before any incident. And then afterwards, in terms of instant response, then we can advise on engagement with regulators, law enforcement, or affected third parties. There are very significant risks that could flow from a data security incident, including potential enforcement by regulators or follow on litigation. So it's much better to have your lawyers on board straight away, advising to mitigate on those risks. And importantly, if you have your lawyers on board straight away, then you can create a privileged communication channel. So you can work with your lawyers to um, make sure that as many internal communications as possible are privileged the confidentiality in those communications protected, which may assist down the line in the event of engagement with regulators or possible follow on litigation. So that is an extremely high level, um, a few buckets for, for companies to, to consider. I think the sort of key takeaways from that is engagement, engagement with all of these areas for a business to seek involvement in these areas across the whole business from anyone who would be involved. Engage external advisors early and seek their input, use their expertise. Walk through scenarios, role play them, stress test them, make sure that any plans in place are actually effective in practice, not just in theory. And also in, in involve to the extent possible everyone in the business and make sure they understand what their role is in protecting the business and how they can contribute to protecting the company altogether. So that, that covers off those areas at a very high level. Thanks, Nick, that's great. And, and two things that you said in particular, I think that chime with me and I, I was a, a, worked in an organization about five years ago that suffered a pretty significant attack. We scrabbled around for 24 hours because all of our phone systems were online, all of our phone directories were online, and I can't believe how long it took to get a WhatsApp group up and running. So um, the idea of having something kind of in your bag, your back pocket, your wallet, that, that, that the kind of business continuity idea as to where to go and who to speak to, I think is a really valid point. So, so thank you for that. Um, I know there's a couple of questions in the chat function, and I think these are largely for Peter. Uh, so the first one, uh, I'll put to you, Peter. So, um, yeah, a common a common query that comes up with a lot of our clients, and that certainly come up in the chat, is around whether some of the insurance policies on the market allow the customer to choose the third party consultants to work with. So they may already have a relationship with some of these partner companies, and the point that's made there that's valid is. 
um, some, sometimes it's, you know, these might be on a retainer you've already got in place, they know your business and, and, and might be in, in there quicker. In your experience, is that possible? Can customers say, you know, we want your cover, but we want to use our, our, own, our own consultants? Um, so the answer is yes, um, with a quantifier on the end of it. So, so um, the insurers have uh, a, normally a defined set of panel of, of, of companies they like working with, but they're more than open to having a discussion with the client if the client wanted to use a specific, say, forensics provider or legal firm. Um, and, and the quantifier is two things. One is from a capability point of view. Actually, it, it, might, it might surprise some people, but the insurers do like to look work with top companies because they know that actually spending a bit more at this stage reduces the cost uh, in the long term. So actually, there's a quality piece in there. Um, but there's also a rate cap point of view. So some, say, US legal firms um, that a company might want to work with um, could be quite significant hourly cost, much more than what um, a, you know, a, a good legal firm would be. So, um, but even then there's a discussion that says, okay, the insurer is happy to pay up to X amount per hour. If the company wanted to pay more, but still use that client, that's up to them and they can and, and the insurer would cover that point. So there's definitely those discussions around there um, that, that's, uh, that's available for most insurance companies. No, it sounds like a good point. It's about have an early discussion and um, try, try, try and yeah. sort it out. Just um, thinking one, one thing, Hazel, where, where you can come um, uh, a little bit unstuck would be something like, let's say you outsourced, um, I'll pick IBM, not for any other reason, that's just a brand name. You outsourced your IT to IBM. You also had a retainer for forensics with IBM mm -hmm. um, and you had an incident. The insurance companies get a little bit more concerned here because there could potential conflict of interest. So if your outsourcing company is the one that's actually had the issue, then they're marking their own homework potentially. So then you tend to see maybe they want to have a, a separate third company, a third party to come in just to, to validate that to make sure there's no conflict there. Yeah. So I guess maybe the takeaway from for, for those on the call is, you know, you can have the conversation and, and see what's negotiable. But but key key is clarity, I guess, in terms of what yeah. the cover is, what extra you may need to pay, and, and the rules of those involved to make sure there's no duplication or, or I guess, we're still gap, gaps emerging at, at just the wrong time. And do it early. <laughs> do, it, do it at the time of renewal. Don't have the conversation when you're having the breach. Yeah. So again, it's back to Nick's point about preparedness and you know, making sure that you've got everything aligned so when there is an issue, you're not having to make those decisions you, or have that discussion. One thing the insurers get really upset about is spending their money without actually consulting them first and then coming back and asking for it. So it's just get all those things out, get them clear, get it documented so there's no issues when, when you have an issue. Yeah, and I guess picking up on one of Nick's points and, and, and you've talked about this and our last speaker did too but if you're looking at scenario planning and and running a mock exercise part of that should be who do we phone and why and what are they going to do um and, yeah. and again clarity of rules great um second question on the chat function again again probably for you peter is um is there is there a kind of compare the meerkat.com website or some other place that you can go to see a comparison of cyber insurance brokers of policies in your experience? It's a good question. Um, not that I'm aware of would be the answer. And obviously, you know, with my Lofton hat, it's come and see Lofton. But but ultimately, I think that that, that the point what would normally see from a client point of view would be an RFP process where you know, they, they go out, basically the, the broking teams come in to, to present to the client to say, this is how this is how Lofton or Willis or Marshall, whoever they might be, would look after you. Um, and, and they do the analysis for you around the policies um, and then present that back to you. So that's how normally, there are companies out there that, that do a sort of a third party um, for you. So you can work direct with, a, an, a, I guess, a, a, another company that helps you choose brokers and insurance policy. <laughs> Um, but again, you know, from a broking point of view, they're saying it's kind of just repeating what the broking house would do. So there's not a go compare. Um, I think for, for really small business, so, you know, if you're a, a one or two person type business, you probably could do that for, you know, the, some of the, like Hiscox will, will have straight to, to the um, customer direct without a broker and that very small business, there might be some, but certainly not once you're getting into the more um, in, in a substantial sort of companies, it's, it tends to be driven by the company requesting the brokers to come in and explain how they would look after your business. But that's a great point, I think, for people that maybe you know haven't gone down this route before, that you can go out to to, to consultancies and broker firms and ask 
ask them to come in and, and, and set out the kind of the, the basic cover and explain the policy, its limitations, its benefits to, to you know, kind of beauty parade you talked about to, to, to give people that overview and allow them to compare what's maybe right for their business. And unless you're a law firm or have a good laws, a law team and you want, you know, I read the policies, okay, I'm getting a bit better now, but I spent all my career in cyber security. And the first time I looked at it, I said, I don't understand what it's saying. You know, so it actually the, the policies are still written in a very legal um, and, and, and in some ways um, sort of old school type wording that can be difficult for non-experts to translate. And I think that's where you can start getting issues about not understanding what the policy can cover for not. So I think that's where the value of, of, of a broking team or the legal team looking at it and really understanding the ins and outs of what a policy will cover. So there's no surprises. Great. And a couple of a couple of comments that have been given in advance um, by participants. Um, Nick, I'll, I'll, I'll give you first bite of the cherry on this one. Um, can you give us an example of um, good practice where a client or organisation has been really effective at kind of supporting customers through an incident um, and how this has helped kind of mitigate risk and, and, and just, you know, kept the customer in, informed? Any examples from your perspective of, of good practice that's worth sharing, Nick? I think for, from what we've seen, it, it's customers who are really, who have clearly spent time and effort in, in engaging with what's happened uh, and how they're trying to assist customers on it. So uh, they've actively looked to bring in uh, the best consultants in the industry with a view to just implementing best practice where possible. They've been really open to advice from their external uh, advisors. So they haven't gone in with a sort of preconceived set of how they're going to uh, approach something, but are really receptive to advice and um and assistance and who have taken sort of all available steps to to get in touch with potentially affected um parties keep them updated feel like so that the the individuals feel like they're in the loop and are not being kept in the dark about what's going on i mean it's often very difficult there's a real balance between how much information they have to share with people what they can actually sort of go out and tell people but as long as they're making people feel that they are being updated and kept in the loop and then that's half the battle um and it's trying it, it, it's just it's just to some extent putting aside sort of self-interest and and making sure that they're engaging with people who've been affected by the incident as much as possible and trying to work together as a team to to get through it and it is almost undoubtedly an extremely difficult process to go through and it can be painful on many levels and extremely hard work but if people feel like the company is engaging with them and trying to work alongside them then that will lead to the best results. Peter from your perspective as I say you, you, you've been you've been in the team the CISO team how have you seen you know examples of an organization going through this kind of crisis and incidents what has been effective at the way that the the kind of the central team, the risk team, have supported, whether it's external customers um, that, that whose data has been lost or affected, or even from the organisation's perspective, the kind of internal, the internal customer, the HR team who can't get access to their payroll data, that that type of thing. Any any suggestions as to good practice that you see? Yeah, it's a it's a really interesting um, question because. Ultimately, when an issue, a significant issue happens with an organization, you know, and luckily from, from my throughout my career, I've not had one that's directly impacted the company, but I was working for a company that was about to be sold and a pair had an issue. And to be fair, that almost went through the same sort of response because there was quite a fear at the board that if that company had the same issue at the same time, they wouldn't be getting the sale price they were looking for. So we almost went through the same thing. But what you learned through that was, um, the first thing is when it, when it happened initially, I was on holiday, um, and 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 because it wasn't our company, um, I, I put in something in place, which was my deputy to talk to the board and say, you know, to assure them it's all okay. We'll get the information about what's happened. We'll check and make sure it hasn't impacted us, and not to panic. And and literally from from that sort of call to when I got back, it was a Friday. On the Monday, the board had gone into complete panic. And, and you kind of couldn't work out why that was until you got there and realized actually a lot of it was around the trust. 
And I don't mean that they didn't trust my deputy, but they didn't know my deputy. So I spend all the time at the board. I'm the one to go present the board papers. I take them through scenario planning. By the natures of the board, they always want to have, you know, they don't want hundreds of people in the room. So it's always, well, you're responsible for it. So I want to speak to you. So I built up a relationship with the CEO, CFO, and the legal team. Um, and, and because I wasn't there, that relationship wasn't active. So then the board kind of thing, well, I don't really know this person. I don't necessarily trust them. So I'll go off and do my own thing. And you had a board panicking, which is a, which is a scary thing. So what I learned from that really was, you know, actually the best plans in the world, um, the human factor is so important. So if you're standing up talking to somebody in the board or somebody decision-making, do they know who you are? Do they trust what you're saying? And can therefore they make decisions from the information you're providing? Um, so you've really got to spend a lot of time on that. You know, it's, it's, it's not good introducing yourself to CFO at two o'clock on a Friday morning saying, hi, I'm your security person. And by the way, you've got an incident. You've got to spend that time to build that personal thing. So that's, that's, that's one side. From an external point of view, um, have a look at, uh, for participants, have a look at Norse Hydro if you haven't already. So Norse um, had a cyber incident um, and they had a ransomware and they didn't pay. But what they did, which was really quite unique, was instead of hiding behind it, like a lot of companies say, you know, your security is important to us. Yes, we've just lost all your information, but, you know, trust us, we're all good. And you don't hear anything from a couple of weeks. Every morning they had a, um, a briefing to to the general public, but also to their clients. Mm -hmm. This is what's happened. This is what we're doing. And this is what we're doing about it. So we completely the other way. And actually they were kind of now held up as one of the examples of how to manage communication to a client, because ultimately you had nowhere to go as a, from, a, from a complaint point of view as a client, because you were getting all the information as they knew. So it was quite an interesting scenario. And they ended up not paying um, and, and it cost them some money, but they came out of it reputationally point of view, I think very high. Yeah. So, so for those on the call, um, the example that Peter just referred to is Norsk Hydro, and I think it was it was that about 20, 2019? That's right, 2019. 20, 2019. If you do a quick Google, there, there's quite a lot of commentary, as Peter says, around how transparent uh, they, they, they were. And um, whilst I, I, I appeal to anyone online, if, if there's any questions or comments you, you want to put to the speakers, put them in the chat. But while we're waiting for any further, a couple of quick comments from me and, and quick observations back would be would be welcome. Um, one example I've seen, there's, there's increased focus, I think, and, and we've talked a lot about it today, about scenario planning. And I know organisations come to us and, and talk about, you know, running desktop exercises or running scenarios. Um, and I think Nick, you'd kind of covered the point around it, it is really difficult to create the environment of a, a cyber attack because you, you've got all of the unknown elements of what might happen. And of course, the added pressure of running, running the organisation, having your day job um, and, and thoughts on how to do this better to get people with that kind of muscle memory, I think we've talked about before, that if something does hit, you know, whilst you've not been through it before, you've been through something similar. And one example I saw a few years ago, which was really effective, was having everybody in a big board, a huge room, and we had um, a huge spread of um, different people from, from different organizations and different roles, so HR, IT, lawyers, customer service, PR people, and we put them in teams, and every five minutes, there was an instruction to the different teams. So we had a kind of PR team, we had the board team, we had the legal team, the risk team. And every five minutes, there was a, a, an overhead slide that would give each of the teams um, essentially a developing scenario and they had to deal with it and they had one minute to take a decision. And obviously it was incredibly high pressure, but it was probably the closest I've seen to creating that slightly awful environment of not really knowing what to do, but knowing you've got to go out with the statement or you've got to report to the regulator, the facts are changing every five minutes. But at the same time, you've got share prices plummeting, you've got, you know, Twitter going mad. Um, any observations, Peter, from your perspective as to how you genuinely try and create that atmosphere to give that little bit of insight and training for a team to really test their processes because um, most of our organizations really struggle to get that that real genuine environment in which they're going to have to take decisions yeah and i'm not sure you can to be fair i think most of the benefit that i have with a client is 
is kind of the 80 20 rule if we can get 80 percent of it right or even more than 90 percent so it's 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 got the basics on, on in a nice controlled environment that says you know these are the kind of these are the people we need involved these are the companies we involve decisions we need to make this is the different points of the, of, of the process that we need to make decisions on and somebody managing that i think most of my clients and most of the time we've done it you get much more value out from that than actually we've got a film crew outside and you need to go out and now do a, do a presentation to a film crew. And, and we've got that because the pressure is always false in a way. And, and actually, um, and, and also it can be confrontational. It can be people get uncomfortable about that because they think they're on show. Um, and, and actually, and, and so I think, unless there's a real desire for companies to, to go to that level, you get much more benefit out of the, 10 a.m. with a coffee around the table, still asking the probing questions. And you know, I'm doing one tomorrow with a client, and we'll we'll go through the key points, but without the stress and pressure from it. Because I think, especially at boards and, and normally the people that are taken from this response plan, they go through that stress and pressure and part of their job and other things that they might do. So really that they kind of know what we're trying to do is make sure they've got the right process and the right information to make the decision. So that would be my thought on it. And, you know, I think everybody might have a slightly different view, but certainly, you know, certainly my colleagues, when I talk through that, they much prefer that sort of more controlled desktop side than try to artificially create pressure. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. Um, like, I think that's that's probably all for from my end. I'm, I'm not going to take up any more of your time, but um, I guess the, the key the key tips from the speakers today is around getting the basics right. Um, and, and as PG said, the basics haven't really changed in 20, 30 years. We're talking about managing access to your systems better, the kind of human factor, um, and, and, Nick, and Nick, you in terms of kind of preparation and, and making sure that you know this journey that everybody's on is 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 a journey you, you know there's never an end point at which all your systems are secure and everybody's fully trained it's a continuing and shifting landscape so like thank you ever so much peter and nick for some really useful observations thank you for your questions both in the chat and beforehand um and um everybody that's um online our last session is a week today same time 12 to 1 p.m um please join us where we're going to have Paddy Tompkins, who's the former Chief Constable of Police, who's now in cyber, cyber resilience building, talking about um, how to manage resilience building and how to manage um, the kind of post actions after an event. Um, but we look forward to seeing you back in a week's time. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody.